HBCU Dodgers Radio, Dodgers After Dark. Welcome back to Enlightening Conversation with young alumni from historically black colleges and universities. Uh, another big show for you tonight. We got uh, line brother KD, uh, Laurel Yo. from A&T, uh, Tiff about to be thrown off the show, or is the Morganite, frat brother Eric and Winston get him into school. So the first thing we want to turn to is the situation at Fisk uh, with obviously a sex scandal, but the multi layers that are involved with leadership and holding people accountable particularly in the realm of sex uh i don't even know where to start tiffany i'm gonna act like a teacher and start and call on you it's only a problem you know they do something that hurts the university okay so he he did a thing he got caught but did he use university funds like I, that's what i think about first like if your personal life is messed up or it gets messed up or it comes out that it's one thing and people thought it was another. It is what it is. But like I just it's complicated. I don't want people to live well, like they're one step away let's from start there. Did did this does this mess up the university? How many people think it does and why? Mm, I mean I don't think it does. If I mess up, if I mess up. I don't I don't I don't like what do you mean? I mean obviously it is because he's gone. Obviously, it does because he's gone. Should it? I mean, that's my thing. He's gone because it looks bad. Right. Yeah, and it's just yeah. like, were any students or staff involved? Was he running a pros- a gay prostitution ring out of fist? <laughs> I yes. can't say yes or no because Laura is <laughs> not, you know, in the legal profession. That's none of my business. But I just feel like, I mean, we as we understand that HBCUs leadership is very much conservative when they want to be this is all just oh this looks bad and even that guy on the board of trustees said that this is his personal life and we don't want to get involved we don't want to comment on that and get involved in that and it's like okay what that got to do with what's going on at this when is school starting what y'all going to do for the fall and i think that also speaks to how in a broader political sense how we view people in the public sector we still judge them by whether we like them or not and not okay what's your policy what's your track record so Mm -hmm. Sorry to that man. Um, God bless all the best. Um, but that is not changing anytime soon. Although I think it's interesting that, I mean, I don't think it's made as big of a splash because there's a million and one things going on right now, mm-hmm. including a pandemic. So I'm just like, in the greater scheme, that man want to be on Grinder. All the best to him. That has nothing to do with Laurel Ashton Brooks, so I'm gonna leave that there. Eric, you were making faces. Uh, do you do you think that this messes up the institution, or is it just messing him up? I was making faces because of the shots being fired. The shots being fired were hilarious. Um, all all factual, but still hilarious. Um, I, to echo what's been said prior to, like it's respectability politics, you know, in the worst form, right? So like. Mm-hmm. I grew up in a city where, you know, the first person, the per- person who made it responsible for that I got my first job was Mayor Marion Barry. And I learned very early on in high school that when it comes to people that have certain positions, um, there's two sides. There's two sides you could take. You could take it as they're always on. They're all they're a public figure. They're always working that like everything they think, everything they do always matters. Or you could take the perspective that. <laughs> I don't care what they do from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. I care everything that they do from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. I tend to lean on the latter. Um, so for me, it's like it, it messed up the school because I, I think the school had to make a decision if what he did that actually violated the law, right? Like if he actually did something crim- like criminal towards this person that he was engaged into whatever act with. Then the school had to make a decision. They had to have a zero poly, zero tolerance type of viewpoint in this regard. But if it was just like, oh, we found out that he was on grinder, leave him alone. Like, if it's not impacting his job and he's doing a good job, they should let it alone. I think the school was forced to. I think the leadership was forced to make a decision because of the possibility that he did something that was a criminal act, whether that dealt with the school directly or not. Or what do you think? That's what I was going to say. It's funny because I got my first job because of Jack Johnson, who is now a former PG County executive working for the summer programs. Um, 
but it's funny because I think it's all about the legal, the legality of the issue. I think if it was just a social issue, they would be facing a lawsuit if they had put him on leave just for if someone had come out and said he's on Grinder, doing whatever he's doing in his personal life. They really can't do anything with that. Mm-hmm. Now again, they can. They obviously, they obviously boards find ways, um, be it ethically or unethically, to get people out of there. But <laughs> I think it's because there's some some pending litigation coming in terms of whatever charges come about from the investigation about him, you know, physically harming somebody and, and uh, false imprisonment, those type of things. I think that's where the school kind of has an out to this. But I think people are probably more uh, up in arms about him being um, doing whatever he was he's alleged allegedly been doing. But um, and from a school's perspective, he has uh, possible charges pending. So they, you know, they kind of to cut bait. But Fisk is also a very conservative campus, a very conservative school has a very conservative history um, and it's a small private religiously based school in a sense. So I'm sure there are major stakeholders of the university who don't like the look just from moral um, perspectives, which is probably why even if he's cleared of all these things, I don't think he gets his job back for the moral part of this. Winston, you agree? Yeah, no, I think that, uh, you know, the question was like, how does it affect or does it affect? I think it absolutely talk about donors to Orr's point, talk about the conservative nature of the institution being a private institution, a faith based institution. I think it absolutely is going to affect it from nothing else. You know, donors and funders and the, and the image of the institution itself. I think it causes eyebrows to raise. You don't ever want anything negatively associated with people who are vested in your institution. Those who like the alumni are people who think that it's you know, that, that it matters, that the image of Fisk and the history of Fisk matters. If it tarnishes or or steps in the bounds of any of that stuff, it becomes an issue. And if it becomes an issue, you got to do things like put people on leave. You got to do things like separate the name from the institution for a period or whatever. Like it forces your hand to that point of having to say, we really need to look at this situation. And then it puts you in the in the news. If you search Fisk University, the first 10 news feed things that come up, that's is, is about that. You don't ever want that to be the situation when somebody just puts the name of your school in a Google search engine. So that that becomes an issue. KD. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to repeat anything that anyone said. I just hope that the university is acting on behalf of the victim, right? And so I hope that they're believing in the victim and that's why they asked them to sit down and for no other reason. Because, you, I mean, I think we as a community tend to put our um, public leaders at a, at a much higher bar than we probably should because our, our counterparts don't do that. Mm-hmm. Like if I, and, and, and in similar situations, our counterparts would just sweep this under the rug and push forward, especially if they know they can get the dude cleared of all charges, right? So it's, um, you know, it's, it's I don't even think it's a double-edged sword. It's just so much, it's just a lot that we don't know. And I'm just going to take caution and believe in the victim first. And then allowing him to clean it up. Although I know you're innocent until proven guilty in this case, <laughs> because of the nature of the s- scandal, um, you just gotta <laughs> you just gotta listen to all sides. And we probably won't ever hear from the victim directly. That's the thing. So, like the the university is doing what they have to do to protect, like I said, the donors and the board and the institution and the reputation and all that so it, it just is what it is I, I, it's unfortunate but what else can you do in it's interesting case? because I, I think that we learned a couple of lessons from the Jackson State situation um, because it wasn't so long after that broke that William Bynum was saying you guys terminated me unfairly um, hmm. you know and then there were some definitions about what does for cause mean um, there were some definitions about should he be retained as a tenured faculty member, which is a typical um, element of most presidential contracts. OK, so you caught me with a, a prostitute. All right. Are you saying that I can't I can't have tenure? Because that's two separate things like you can fire me as president. You can't fire me as a tenured faculty member. That's that's something else, um, which is granted to me as a result of me leaving the institution under any circumstances, whether I fired or I got fired or resigned. So that's one thing. Another thing is, again, defining the 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 prospect of, of being fired for cause, because some people would stretch that definition to say, well, what I did or, or, you know, whatever I did outside of the institution isn't cause in terms of what I got to do for as president of the institution. So for cause as president may be I didn't keep enrollment up. I didn't raise money. 
I didn't manage um, operations well. I ran a deficit. Those are things that you would say that was for cause on the job. This is outside of the campus borders. So can you say that there's a that there's a reason or a way that you fell down on the job? Now, there could be a morality clause, a morality clause in this contract. Um, but again, it, it puts the school in a difficult situation. And I think it really does hurt the school, because if nothing else happens, there's one of two things that are going to happen if they want to fire him. They either going to have to buy him out, which is going to cause money that they probably don't have. Or they're going to have to to take up the the idea that it's for cause and we don't want to buy you out. And that may be a court issue that he, he, may, too. he may be willing to fight because it is such a scandalous headline that it may be I'm in a I'm better off trying to stick here with this job and get a settlement, perhaps than trying to move on and get another presidency, because that probably won't happen um, pending the, you know, the outcome of this investigation. But the other thing is, I think normally in situations like this, you would say, or at least the, this conspiracy in me would say, you know, part of this, I wonder if they're out to get him. I wonder if somebody can make a complaint, stir, stir up enough dirt and just say, this is something that happened. But there's a part of, you know, and, and it's already out there, whether it's true or not, it's already out there. But there's a part of me that says, I don't know if if Fisk has the political juice in Nashville where politicos and people in power care. I don't think that you, you Fisk know, gonna play themselves, man. I don't think that they it mattered enough for them to say, let's go get somebody to make a claim against the president of Fisk. That if you look at the, the community, they're building all around that institution. It's not like they're trying to make a land grab for it and get Fisk up out of here. It's not like they, you know, that what Fisk does or what the students say, you know, unlike a school like Howard or A&T is going to move an election of some sorts. You know, it's not it's not a political force. It may be a cultural one, but it's not a political one. So you you have to imagine that there, there's nothing in place from that that structure that surrounds Fisk that says protect Fisk president at all costs or get rid of him. You know, what there's I mean? another there's another angle to a power play that. If we're, if we're being conspiracy theorists, there's another angle, which would say who underneath him had an issue with him that would have believed something. Well, that's the other part, happening. because if you look at Fizz Twitter, immediately the students and the alumni say, good, get him up out of here. This was instant. Like it was almost like there was this groundswell. And that was for a lot of reasons, cutting some staff that were very popular, that were very popular on campus. A lot of people didn't like that. A lot of the moves with, you know, uh, academic realignment and some hires. A lot of people didn't like that. That happens with every president. You don't like who goes and who stays. But they instantly applied the pressure to say this dude got to go. And I wonder if the board looked at that and said, it, it seems to your, your, your point, uh, Katie, they could have said, you know, it's not true. We're moving on. Like what, you know, you're all going to have a, a long way to hoe if you're going to try to prove I was on Grinder, I broke into somebody's apartment, I had a gay relationship. That's a that's a lot to prove off a protective order. They could have said, he says it's not true, we're moving on. End of story. Instead, 24 hours later, he's out of there, at least on leave. So it makes me wonder, was that swell of support from the campus community enough to say that was the straw we were looking for? And if so, it, it hurts the school additionally, because if that's true, now you're facing in the middle of a pandemic, the process of right. a presidential search, right? a new administration. So that's new VPs, that's new deans, that's a whole slew of people that's going to be new in those positions. And for what? Because he was on Grindr. You know what I mean? Like, so I think I take the position that this is harmful to the institution for for things that may not have to do with the act or the allegations themselves. Yeah. So there's no way this ends, this ends well for them because if yep. it, if it, if they have an issue with him, then they played themselves. This is not the time or place to try to get somebody out of there. Yeah. If it's not true, then he's going to sue. Mm -hmm. He's going to win a bunch of money, and they're going to look even worse. Mm -hmm. And I'm I live very close to Texas Southern. I have friends who go there. And even with how that situation is going, the university is not operating as smoothly because they don't have a president. Oh. Like things are not moving in the way in which they should with their campus opening plan. All these different things going on, the university is behind on because, in my opinion, they don't they have um, shaky leadership. So I see Fisk in the same thing where no matter what happens, the school takes a dip because of this. Nothing good will come up from the in the in the interim. 
maybe a year from now they get a better president and, and everything smooths over. But for the next six to 12 months, they're in the water because this is terrible news, terrible PR news. And even if they don't like him, sometimes it's it's better to leave with the one you came with than to you know try to move in the middle of the dance. But who knows? Let me ask this, you guys this question real quick. So this has happened twice, at least in 2020, um, that we know of, that it's public. Do you think that this, cha- and or as you brought this up, do you think that this changes the conservatism about sex on HBCUs? Because I think, do, do you think that black college culture looking at this and looking at, okay, a second incident, um, and that's in addition to all the ones that we, we know aren't public, but we just know are out there, do you think that this forces the, the culture to say, we got to buckle down and get right with the Lord or just accept that some of us are freaks, some of us are gay <laughs> and some of us like hoeing around and it is what it is. Like I, I, you, next to the black church, the black, the black college culture is the second most conservative thing and not by a, not, not by a, a far margin. They're very conservative because they're church rooted. Say, you know what I mean? Um, so, so does it? Does do you think the culture has to say we got to make a change? Not just with this, no. but with with everything going on. No, I, mean, I think it will, but I don't think it'll be on the part of administration. And I think in general, post COVID, a lot of things in higher ed will have to change just by default. No. And so, I mean, HBCUs aren't the only schools that are very much deeply church rooted. May were started by the church. You could also look at institutions that have been started by different sects of the Catholic Church, where originally the church was running the school, but then eventually they bought them out, and now it's being administered by a president. But they're still Catholic affiliated. Look, at, look at Liberty. Liberty. Jerry Falwell got caught with his pants. Ooh, he out. So Liberty, Liberty, you can't throw in there because the evangelical schools is. That's something a different. monster of a different issue. Mm-hmm. Um, long time coming. I cannot wait for that expose to come out. Um, <laughs> but, but I just think, um, just in general, I mean, even, I mean, people said for years that, oh, Jerry Falwell runs Lynchburg and mm-hmm. he's never going to And look at that. And we're not even over with 2020. Right. So who knows what could happen by December? Um, mm-hmm. I think for HBCUs, they've been so rigid for so long that it would take a global pandemic to finally move the needle. How much that moves, I don't know. I do think um, in response to George Floyd and constant political pressure, social pressure, like all of those things are intertwined. And I think, you know, I don't, we also still have the election. (laughs) Um, So all of those things, I mean, who's to say what it's gonna look like in March of next year or even two years out. And so we can say that, oh, well, these administrations are still conservative. I'm like, people going to retire. Right. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. want to speak ill on anyone's health, but some people might not see 2021. It's, it's a new day. And so I think that, yeah. you know, the, the old guard is changing by default and then it's being forced to change by all of these different things going on right now. And honestly, for the next five years, um, I just think all of that plus um, the students who do represent some of those people where they may not be out yet. They may be on grinder or they're trans or they're engaging in sex work to pay for school because school is still expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's kind of like, too, when you, when administrations make those decisions about someone who's a president or an administrator and they're doing, quote unquote, lascivious things in their personal life, what they do in response will still speak to a student that'll say, OK, we're doing the same thing. Basically, I got to shut the hell up or they're going to kick me out, too. It, so, I, you know, I just think. I'm sorry. I just had to get this out because I'm going to forget it. I'm old. It wasn't that long ago that Alabama State said, hey, Gwendolyn Boy, you can't have just anybody up in your house. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So that, that, wasn't, that wasn't that long ago. And now you're having these things. And, and Tiffany, you were on the record last week saying we're not going to be able to stop the students from having the sex. No. Are we, at a, point, are we at a point where we got to say we have to be more comfortable with our presidents and leaders having the sex in the way they want to have the sex? Because I think that you're starting to see these these things where it's like, and I got a theory about this. Let me get into this real quick. Hold on, hold on. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you, I just want to set it up proper. I think that this stuff is starting to happen because a lot of these leaders can't travel. No, I'm I'm dead serious. 
One of the things, wow. one of the things that, that okay. I believe and people, them and the players in the NBA bubble, you know, they got listen. I think that is, I think that a lot of folks in higher ed, when you spend so much of your time buttoned up trying to say the right thing, trying to do the right thing, one of the worst kept secrets of of, of higher ed, black white, is that they get loose at conferences. I mean. That's definitely, that's, that's definitely that's, the worst kept secret. That that that's just a no. That's, that's, that's every industry. <laughs> that's every that's industry, that's but that's people, get loose, oh, people get loose. People get loose, and wait, there's wait. and there's all kind of entanglements in our in, in our sector. I ain't gonna call no names. Uh, we ain't go, we're not gonna talk about <laughs> higher ed like it's the CBC, okay? Like, <laughs> so what I'm saying is, because people can't pe- people can't travel, they're doing their dirt locally, and so Tiffany, I throw it to you because of that, or if, the, if whether you buy that theory or not. Do we have to move in a direction where we got to be a little, a little more flexible, a little more tolerant of sexual identity, sexual activity with our presidents? Because we don't have a problem legislating it with students. No, we don't. Um, First, for my point last week, that was centered around containing corona, (laughs) not limiting the sex and how often these kids need it right that's my only point because i mean i just came back from the hotel where some of the kids are staying and it's a whole thing so i'm like that that was oh that God. point not about policing what they need out of life mm-hmm. but honestly we gotta get free we have got to get free and freedom Includes having the sex how you need the sex with whom you need the sex safely, 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 safely. Yes. Or as you said, is every industry? Eric laughed at the conferences, so I'm interested in y'all two weighing in on this. So, I mean, again, obviously, I work in the hospitality industry, who hosts all these conferences. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's generally i mean this is why the number one convention locations in the country are las vegas new orleans and miami do any of those cities say buttoned up to you (laughs) right right (laughs) so so uh, i mean i think that there's in general there's a a convention uh conference culture um internationally this is why people go to um you know to to bangkok and and singapore and stuff for conventions as well internationally Mm -hmm. um because people like to get out of their environments and um they fellowship i'll use that word they fellowship (laughs) um with one another and they get deep research you know started at these uh different events but i I think (laughs) i think i'm gonna do with it as well but i think what makes things worse at least in my opinion is that there's a lot of um, repression in general society right now because there's obviously there's no business travel. There's people aren't in school, um, and people can only hold up their facade for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, and eventually, you know, uh, who you are outside the house comes comes inside. Um, if those people aren't the same, mm-hmm. so I, I think that you know every study shows that domestic violence is up. All these different statistics are up inside people's homes because people don't have the freedom to do what they do. Mm-hmm. But I think in terms of our schools and leadership, I think that it's very difficult because our campuses usually are transitional in terms of generations. We have people who are very old on campus, people who are very young, people who are in the middle. Um, and we see being conservative as the way to kind of bridge those three or four uh, different mm-hmm. generations. But I think that the challenge is, it, the challenge is I saw my friend about the other day, is like, with people being online or remote or not having the interaction, maybe leaders would just be like, we're good. I can do what I want to do because I don't have to answer to, you know, the older woman who works, who's been an admin for 40 years. Mm-hmm. I can kind of say what I want to say because she ain't going to be on Zoom anyway. Um, <laughs> and I can't fire her. So we'll just ignore her presence. So Eric, <laughs> you, you, you agree with the conference philosophy or the conference theory? I'm not. I, I, what I'm going to say is, is that some things that are said about these conferences we know are unequivocally true, right? Um, we can sit here and say that there are certain conferences that hit D- D.C. every single year. The majority of work done happens in the hotels and not actually inside the actual convention halls, right? Mm-hmm. So, but to kind of echo a lot of people's points, like... He's talking about HBC you know, week. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, actually. 
<laughs> nah, he talking about C. He talking, he talking about, about CBC. CBC. <laughs> it happened the same week. Yes, he said. They still lose. They do, but they look. Listen, they are entangled. Ooh, they, they, they are entangled. It's a big diagram because, like, the HBC brain test is right in the it's middle. Right there. So, yep. like, it's so enough is. Yep. Nah, you're not lying about that. Nah, um, okay. I, I think. Also, I mean. Uh, and I had this discussion with, you know, a, a old good friend of mine. She's a director of conduct at HBCU. And she said, she was like, we have so much of a blind spot towards real life issues because we don't want to acknowledge certain things. I, I'll never mm -hmm. forget. I was an RA and we had domestic violence within a within a residence hall room because a girl was able to move in with her girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And for mm -hmm. three months, that was taking place. But that's a blind spot because we don't want to acknowledge that, oh, that's right, people are having relationships in, in that having non-heterosexual relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, mm -hmm. right? But the domestic violence has to be addressed. We have to be have to be cognizant of that. Over some time, like we, we still sit here talking about how schools don't serve alcohol at sporting functions. We sit here and talk about the domestic violence issues across the campus and things of that nature. And I'm just like I know I know a lot of our leadership is scared because it's already hard enough being black. But guess what? Being black is not a monolithic experience. There's other things that are layered into our blackness that we have to address and we have to acknowledge as being real. And if we don't, we're going to continually have situations like this where we should be having more of a discussion about, oh, did he actually hurt this person? Did he actually commit a crime against this person? Meanwhile, the primary discussion is, he was on Grinder. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, not the most like, important thing in the world. Right. It's, it's not, not the most. It's not the most important thing in this conversation. So I, I think you know the respectability politics make we box. We're boxing ourselves, and I understand to a degree why that is. But it starts with us at every single level. There are people who are conservative that that are in school right now. <laughs> That are younger than us. There are people who are conservative who are the entry level uh, higher ed student affairs workers, all the way up to those people who are old farts that that need to retire and do it, but won't because they want they want something to do. So it, it's 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 multi layered. It's it's too much going on. But at the end of the day, I just want our presidents to like move different. <laughs> That's all I want because the fact that we can't get most of our schools past five years with a single president is bad, as, bad as enough as it is. Lord have mercy. Let me, um, let's let's take a quick break right here. We're gonna get into our uh, second conversation about uh, the things that we've learned since some of our campuses have opened back uh, in full or in hybrid mode and what the next couple of months will look like. And then we're gonna have a conversation about uh, what's happening with the HBCUs in Pennsylvania. Um, this is an underreported story and I think we gotta pay a little bit uh, more attention to it. So Dodgers After Dark, we'll be right back. <laughs> Dodgers After Dark, and we're back. Uh, continuing our conversation on the reopening effort in the, the era of COVID-19. So last week, we had a conversation about what the pitfalls and opportunities may be with HBCUs trying to reopen. Um, and obviously as, as safely as they know how and in a weekend at some campuses and i'm gonna start with Lowell because her school is at the middle of it um <laughs> there's just there's just a sense that and tiffany just said this before we jump back on there we come we coming home in about a month and a half because you're <laughs> not gonna stop these young people from at a minimum standing on the quad or standing on the yard and just talking without masks on that's not even to mention the sex. That's not even to mention the things that, that may happen off campus. You can't force them to live in a bubble. You look at situations like Southern University where they literally looks like it has a sheet up between two beds in a room. Um, you look at you look at places where uh, th they have curfews going. They have plans being done and there's no details like it at me and Orzama, Modern Morgan State, Air mandatory testing. Well, how? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? You get a you get a mandatory test and it's and it's good. You're good. You're negative today. You could be positive tomorrow. So, same buoy. Uh, throw, throw in buoy. Same buoy. See what I mean? Today. So same thing as Morgan. What have we learned, Laurel? I start with you. One from the babies just saying, not that we're immune, but this is not top of mind anymore. Y'all didn't held us back too long. It's our time now. And what does that mean for the the institutional? 
uh, integrity and what does it mean for the culture? I mean, <laughs> I was not surprised because, you know, the frontal lobe of the brain does not develop until <laughs> the third decade of life in most, most people. So, you know, and I think, you know, I, on one hand, I get it. Everyone's been shut in. They have cabin fever, et cetera, et cetera. And then especially for freshmen, that's why a lot of initial plans for bringing students back had, you know, everyone else is going to be online, but like freshmen will be on campus and whatever type of limited capacity for the schools that could do it. So it's like, I understand that rationale, but at the same time, it's like people that are 17 and 18, they're not, I mean, we all know how much mono was spread on campus huh. and COVID is not mono. Right. We don't know what COVID is yet. Mm -hmm. And so I think even, even here in DC and just, you know, people having block parties and cookouts and house parties that have to get shut down and it's over a hundred people. It's not really, I mean, I think it's just with youth. You think you're going to live forever when you're 18. You're not, unless you have a extremely tragic home life where everybody's dead. Um, you're not, you're not as attuned with your mortality mm -hmm. when you're young mm -hmm. because you're like, well, fine, you know, okay. I broke my leg. It healed in like, you know, a month I'm straight. Or like, okay, I did get, I got COVID, but you know, it only took me out for a week, but I was, I'm straight. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, it doesn't come, it doesn't become real until you're hooked up to machines or like, I've heard of people that are like younger than me and they survived COVID, but they have to wear a colostomy bag and mm. be on dialysis for the rest of their life. Jesus. And they're not even 30 yet. Mm. So it's like, you know, again, same as with Trump. I don't know what else has to happen <laughs> For people to get people it, to take it seriously. the work has happened like twenty times over, and people are still like, "Whatever, whatever." I don't care. So I think for schools, I mean, I feel like it's a choice. It's either have you know whatever amount of students on campus, do what you can to enforce it, or do what other schools have done, which people had issue with. But it's like, you know, have students sign a clause and say that you know I agree to be on campus and I will not sue the university. And then if we want to take it a, a step further, I don't think any HBCU would be psycho enough to do this, but be like Boston University and say, oh, you, you can get your degree. You will award degrees posthumously if Ooh. you die. <laughs> Jesus. You know, I mean, it sounds, and it sounds, it sounds so macabre, but I'm like, that's where we're at now. And so I feel like administrations need to really, if it's a matter of saving, saving money, because no matter what they're going to do, students going to complain. We know that. So it's like, which complaint do you want to get? Do you want to get like at least 500 different lawsuits for wrongful death? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to finagle some type of online hybrid partition it? I mean, I think, I think also too, like even in the midst of the pandemic, we've had to find different ways of connecting with people and accept that, okay, maybe I can't do it in person, but that doesn't mean, you know, Granted, I've been on a million Zooms, but one more isn't going to kill me because I really want to connect with my um, class, my incoming class. And as we've heard before, you know, look to your left, look to your right. The person next to you might not my graduate dear. with you. Right. I mean, is that really different? So I, I just think that, I mean, I think for the students, it's still not real yet. And so I feel like for administrations, you know, do what you can, but also have a, and I don't want to call it an escape plan, but have an escape plan like, okay, if we get, if we get like 10 cases, shut it down. Send everybody home, do online. Well, that, that's the question. Let me throw it to Katie, who's immersed in darkness right now. Um, <laughs> do you, if it, would the 18 year old you take the position of, I gotta, I, I gotta make sure that I'm not giving anybody COVID or I'm not catching it. Or would you just say, would, do you think that you would be taking the risk and be like, it ain't that bad, we're outside. It's not like we're in a building, we're outdoors. <sighs> what, how do you think you would have approached it at 18 years old? Wow. 18 year old me didn't even want to go to college. Um, <laughs> so I'm different than these babies. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't look at it like that, mm -hmm. but at 18, um, if you told me there was something life threatening and I needed to stay home, I would have stayed home. Um, and I would have made all of my family stay home to the best of my ability. I really, I just, cause as I'm, um, as educated, I am mob nervous that I'm going to be in the classroom in November. Mm -hmm. And I, let, let's, let's say I know how to protect myself. I don't want to see 10 students drop right. when we could have easily just stayed home until January. And I think, I just, I think people really realize need to realize we might need, need just six more months. It's, that's a tough ask, but just six more months of being apart from each other. So we can actually figure this shit out. 
Because otherwise, like she, like Laurel said, I mean, I'm talking about 500 wrongful deaths. It might be 10 per campus between all of the HBCUs. That's going to close some schools. Well, let me, th- you make an excellent it, point. And, and actually, to, to piggyback off what Laurel said, so let me throw this to Winston real quick and Tiffany and Eric to follow up on this. Since y'all work with students, high school and college on campus, at let me start with Winston. At what point does a school that you may be targeting for some of your young people in Detroit, is there a number where you say, I'm, I'm cutting that off. I'm not sending anybody to that, that school because and even let's not even say the campus. Let's say just the city. Let's say if it's a hot spot like like um, like Houston was at some point, at some point, do you say I'm not? And, and that's not to make fun of Oars because he went to Morgan. But it is to say, would you? look at a school like Texas Southern and say, I'm not sending kids from Detroit down there because it, it appears that it's just too dangerous. Well, Texas Southern's a good example because two students who were supposed to be going there are now doing uh, online courses from Detroit. They're not going to Houston any longer that we had going there this year. Um, there's a lot of apprehension around Georgia. There's a lot of apprehension. We had the Morehouse Film and Clark students that we have which, you know, the Spelman Morales piece got taken care of. But, but those, I mean, before, I mean, I would I'm, we, I would have the conversation. I wouldn't leave it to this. Um, I try not to tell them, you know, like, oh, don't go here. You, you know, I wouldn't advise you to go here. I'll give you the information. I'll allow you to analyze it. I'll talk to your parents. We'll have, we can have a sit-down conversation about what it looks like. I try to refrain from doing everything but saying don't go. I just want to make sure we got all the facts on the table. Like, what we're talking about, you know, and it's no different than other things that, you know, affect our institutions like accreditation and other things. Like, to me, it's the same type of thing, even though this is obviously life-threatening is life-threatening, but in general, it's no different than if a parent has concerns about accreditation with an institution. And I'm like, okay, well, we can talk about pain or Bethune-Cookman or whatever institution insert institution in that in that vein you know i want to make sure we don't act like it doesn't exist and we can have a full-fledged conversation let's let's talk it out um my main the main thing for me was just to be make sure they're aware of it and more so than to a detriment a deter i'll let you make the decision you know i didn't i didn't tell those young people don't go to houston but um, we did talk about the conditions and what it is for so they they are one of them had already dealt with that and then they, their parents were not comfortable with you know, obviously with them going to, to Texas in the midst of, of all this as well. So, I mean, it, to me, it's more about just being informed yeah, and having right. a conversation. Yeah. 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 Tiffany, you, you and Eric, y'all work with students on campus. So what are the conversations like with you guys leading up to trying to come back or even now that, that some people are back? What, are, what kind of questions are you getting? What kind of advice are you providing? Um, what are you hearing from administration that you should say or that you should explore to be of help to the to the school in that way? So first, and this, these two things are connected, at least in my mind, they are. So for somebody like me who has parents who are. Um, I don't even know. My dad doesn't have an immune system, right? Mm. He is a double kidney transplant recipient is he's had kidney disease for most of my life so i've lived life with somebody who is vulnerable is vulnerable so like we we have been raised to be very careful Mm -hmm. and so when all this started happening it's like all right we already know like we we already know how to do it right right and we're to laurel's point we're very aware of our mortality and our parents mortality because they have life-threatening conditions that they navigate every day. Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, my brother, he lived with me for most of quarantine Mm -hmm. because it was safer for him to do so. It was, we're in the country in Kentucky. He he had already spent most of 2019 in Kentucky. Sending him back home would have been very dangerous because in 48235, that had the worst um, amount or the the highest amount of infection rate, yeah. Infection rate in Detroit. And that is our zip code. Mm-hmm. And so my mother was like, Yeah, no, he's staying there. Mm-hmm. It is what it is. For me, talking to these students and knowing where our students come from, we have a lot of kids from Detroit, obviously, from Ohio, from Indy, from Georgia, from Florida. There's one young man here who recruited like 20 people. 
to come here. We have a lot of people from Florida. Mm. And so in my head, I'm like, kids hit me up on Instagram, on Twitter in the DMs. When do you know when we coming back, Miss B? Da, 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 da. I'm like, chill. Especially if you're from a place where you have a governor that's not handling their business. <laughs> you don't be coming anywhere because you're gonna bring your germs from okay. where you live yep. into small ass Frankfurt. Oh. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, we've not lived through a pandemic in a hundred plus years. This is new for everybody. I get it. You don't want to be at home with your parents. It may not be the best situation, but coming here, mm-hmm. this ain't going to be the best situation either because we're going to be just like y'all. Mm-hmm. With, then few, what? with fewer resources to deal with it in terms of exactly. hospitals and all that kind of stuff. Eric, is, exactly. it, is it the same on your end? <sighs> So I have the luxury of working with a bunch of petulant children who masquerade as adults looking for graduate degrees. <laughs> um, no, and I mean this in a very serious way because as an institution that I worked at, you know, just I'm just going to be quite frank. We had a different plan for each individual institution that was there. And because all of them were publicized, we literally had I had one student in one of my programs who's an online student who started a petition to force us to go back to in-class courses for this upcoming fall. And he ain't never touched a campus a day in his life. Mm. Just oh. like, general principal, like, just because he was just like, well, this other campus, the, the, well, the law school campus is going to be back on, on going to be back on campus. We should be back in the building too. I was like, there's 21 graduate programs that are have, op- operating inside this one building. We operate upwards of at least 22 classes in a two hour span every single day mm-hmm. for between Monday and Thursday. And you think this is the wisest ideal idea in downtown DC, mind you. Right. So I get to, I, I, when I do talk to students that are more in the undergrad space and I'm having conversations with them, a lot of it is just pretty much informing them on just the reality of the situation. And not talking to them about their mortality, but talk about little small things like, Oh, well, if if I'm at home, why am I not getting a tuition discount? Because your school can't afford it. Let's just start there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like, and mostly it's also because uh, if your school already had an online program, the students in that online program were already paying what you're paying. Exactly. Subtracting (laughs) subtracting the fees, right? Let's have that discussion. Well, well, why can't we go back to campus? Well, because we know right now you're at home and you won't stay at home. So why we bring you here? Mm -hmm. Right now, like I said, I, I will say, that there are certain situations and exceptions that students should have been brought back to campus and in doing so they should be should still be taking online classes in their rooms if they live in a domestic violence situation if they would have been homeless if they were not in college Mm -hmm. they should be back on campus there's things that we can do to make sure that these things take place but for the most part people just don't want to listen and it's not young people it's not black people it's people mm-hmm. like we just really at this point that people just don't want to say that, bro. Say that, and 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 it is something that you can do. So like maybe our, maybe our schools do need to take the perspective of Boston University and just be like, oh yeah, well you know what, this is the clause. If you decide to not adhere to the direct to the rules as such, then it, you know what, we will we will award you your degrees posthumously. Also, we will not refund your money that you paid for tuition so far. Uh-huh. As cold as it might be. It's crazy because initially I, I was worried that, you know, with most things, when HBCUs do it, even if all colleges are doing it, we seem to get the bad rap. It's almost like, look at these black students doing this. or look at these black faculty or this black president doing this when everybody does it. And I was worried initially that people would look at students standing on the yard and say, these black colleges can't control. These students can't control themselves. These campuses can't get under control. But I think that they deserve a lot more credit in the sense that one, a school like A&T is at the mercy of the North Carolina Board of Governors. It ain't on A&T to say, we're open, we're closed, it's gonna be whatever the Board of Governors says as a public institution in a public system. So they're doing the best they can. The next thing is, and I and I, I hope this doesn't, this doesn't offend anybody when I say it, I'm glad that, that that photo or that video and every other one that follows does not involve police coming to break it up that there's some way that one administrator or somebody can walk out there and say, y'all know y'all not supposed to be doing this, but don't let it turn into a situation where 
students who've been who've been bottled up for six months and not necessarily looking for a confrontation but are frustrated with this thing and a police officer or some police officers come out there and say y'all gotta go they cuss at the police officers the police officers get offended and then it's a thing on an hbcu campus so Gram- grambling had to do it they did a, the president gallo did a live today he had to do a live today at four o'clock because uh-huh. it was a large gathering yesterday on campus uh-huh. him and the dean of students had to get on live this afternoon and one of the kids rebuttals to the president talking about hey we gave you guys these rules and guidelines hey the police didn't get involved they didn't tell us we had to go home and he's like look like you guys we, we gave you the rules before you came here the hope is that the, the police don't have to get involved to tell you that and to his point he said i understand that you guys have been locked up. I, we, we get it, you guys have been in the house. You're a lot of you freshmen, the first time being away from home and all those things. But if you guys can't hear this, if we start getting cases, all of y'all going home. And I don't want to have to stay at home, but, I'm, but I will send all of y'all home. Or not just that, but that the, the campus, some of them, the, the effort to send people home, and because we've seen a model like the NBA where you can construct a bubble, I wouldn't be surprised if you have some institutions say, okay, y'all can't deal with it. You go to class, you go to your room. If you're caught, yeah, we see how that's going, though. It's, it's, but see, but, but see, I don't. So Lou I'm, Williams left the bubble to go to the strip club. <laughs> well, he went to a funeral. But I mean, even 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 the wings are delicious. And then, but the even <laughs> even bringing even bringing in sports, right? Like obviously, everyone else, my brother played at a at a, a MEAC school, one of the few MEAC schools left. Um, and and he he's in his last he's in his last semester, and so obviously him not having a season this year. He plays football, you know, it's, it's quite devastating for him. Um, he and he's talking about different things about, but he's talking about a bubble, and we see what other conferences are doing. Not to make this about sports, but I think that HBCUs are in a really weird space because you have schools like FAM, which moved in players. You know, prior to the season being canceled, A and T moved in players. Morgan, my brother, Morgan, mm-hmm. my brother's school, which I won't name, um, did not move in players. Now he lives in Norfolk full time. Damn. Well, there you go. He, <laughs> <laughs> he could go to Hampton he or lives. Norfolk. It's all good. <laughs> well, there's two different schools yeah. there, though. Actually, Hampton he ain't lives, in the act no more. I, cool. I thought you were framing. I thought you. Oh wow. <laughs> he lives. He lives in that region of that state <laughs> right. full time. So there was no move in period needed for him. But but it's a real challenge because I think that when you even look at how they've done athletics with bubbles, they really haven't worked as well as what you'd want them to. And I think the, the bigger problem in many of our schools, I think a school like Alcorn could do a bubble, a school like um, Peak Prairie View could do a bubble, but you can't do a bubble in a, in a urban, even yeah, a semi-urban environment. Right. Yeah. yeah. Even a semi-urban, you can't, you can't do a bubble at TSU. Right. Either TSU. You can't, I mean, you can't do a bubble at any of the other type of schools where there's so much urban interaction and even with the staff have so much urban interaction um where people take or people are taking buses and public transit to and from work and, and different things so i think that the safest thing to do i'm obviously i'm in graduate school and the university of houston system um has decided to go all master's classes are online um they, i don't know what they're doing with undergrads because they my my business but i i, I think that in general coming back to campus is going to shoot a lot of these schools in the foot and i see people going home early and this may cause for more outbreaks that start on campuses and then spread back where people live Jeez. and then we're back at, at step one back because even with one. Bowie, like, like Bowie and morgan at the plan about you have to get a test but i mean right now getting tests is not as simple and depending on what state you're in um, how do you prove this? People can easily modify an email to say, I got tested. I'm there. I mean, it's just so, it, and we don't have the capacity on campus to do a test. No. So I think in general, you know, we've set ourselves in the foot with this. The system to set it up for, set it up for failure. I mean, I think the NC system is one of the worst in the country. And um, I think that, you know, those HBCUs in North Carolina are going to have some serious challenges because. Elizabeth City or Fayetteville or even A&T can't do what Chapel Hill can. Correct. Those students don't have the same resources. So having one blanket plan for the system for everybody, is right. not in our best interest either. Let me let me shift gears real quick, and I think we got to get this in at least at least two minutes apiece. So if you haven't been paying attention, um, two of the, our HBCUs in Pennsylvania, Lincoln University and Cheney University, have had some serious headlines in the recent um, months. Uh, Cheney, if you haven't been paying attention, 
just to backtrack, regained its accreditation. It was under threat of losing it, but it's slowly become a business park, for lack of a better term, for a lot of startup businesses looking to move to that that part of Pennsylvania. I think they have three or four companies, three or four startups that are that are housed on the Cheney campus. Um, the the state is spinning it like this is a good thing, and you know this is this is Cheney being forward thinking, and this is this is going to create a lot of workforce development for the students. I don't buy it. Cheney has always been on on the state's target, and uh, you know I have a I have a philosophy that I I live and I, I work through. Whoever the governor of any state that has HBCUs, whatever they say is good for you, consider the opposite to be true. And so we have now seen Governor Tom Wolf in Pennsylvania chime in on, yes, Cheney will keep its accreditation. Let's 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 do infuse some cash and get some businesses to set up there. Same thing with Lincoln. Lincoln wants to fire a president. The governor says, no, keep that president. She's great. That's not to say that she isn't. It's not. I don't know the lady. I don't, the sister, from all appearances, has been doing a good job from what everybody says. What I will say is that whomever and for whatever a governor says is good for an HBCU, typically the opposite is true. And so I find it interesting that of all these years where Lincoln and Cheney have been at the at the at the tar, a target of Pennsylvania. Now, all of a sudden, the governor is so impressed by the schools that they want to talk about resources and talk about leadership in a, in a more robust way than we've ever seen. Am I just making too much of it or is there something there? And we, we literally got about six minutes. I'll, 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 all right, Eric, so I'll listen, start with you. Listen, all right. So one, it's, it's, they're in a tough situation, right? Because if they refuse it or they refuse the direction of it, then it can go right to back to what status quo has always been, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, it it could make it a little gunshot, right? And that's that's an unfortunate th unfortunate thing. Now, I do think that if they're talking about infusing some money, infusing some businesses in the area, things like that, take advantage of it. Start having some partnerships that can actually make sure that your school is like relevant to the community and and people are actually supporting the, it thriving. Now, that being said, the only question I have, and this is a general question, but it's really pointed at Lincoln based upon what we saw. Who do we go to to save our HBCUs from their board of trustees or regents? Nobody. Because who do they hold, like? Who are they held accountable to? Who like at some point, And this kind of goes back to what happened out in Texas, or was mentioned earlier. But at some point, I'm just kind of like, there's nobody who supersedes the the board of trustees in a real way to stop them from having power trips. Sometimes, and we saw it in Lincoln. I'm not going to comment on uh, uh dr uh dr, dr. allen right but at the same time it's just like all right at any given time somebody can move their way around and it's like you out of there like that's something about that something about that doesn't make you doesn't make me feel right uh, part of that I, I think is that's just the nature of the industry like in, in, in business i mean if a board you know doesn't like a ceo they can say you gotta go now typically that doesn't happen boards of you know uh Various Fortune 100 companies don't move like that. They're a little more strategic than that. But higher education is different because the board is comprised or at least is supposed to be by the will of the people. So you're, you're supposed to elect business leaders and, and different civic leaders to represent the interests of the people in a public institution. But I think all of us who attended public schools, uh, Laurel, me and Ors, Katie, all of us have, have seen what an antagonistic state looks like attacking an HBCU. But it, it appears to me that this is a more covert way to attack an HBCU. This isn't us saying we're going to cut your funding. This isn't us saying we're going to, you know, we're going to we're going to fire your president and fire the board. This isn't them saying we're going to cut your programs. This is them very covertly disguising, quote unquote, progress, but in a totally different way than you traditionally see in, in, in schools. Laura, would you would you agree with that, given your history, looking at A&T and looking at other, other schools around the country? Do you think that Pennsylvania is something different? I mean, I mean, personally, I just feel like they're taking advantage of the social climate, the current social climate and saying, oh, because I feel like it's, it's starting with Pennsylvania. But I feel like other states who are not run by maniacal governors um, will take advantage of this maybe even more covertly than Pennsylvania is by 
saying, oh, well, this looks good. Yeah, we're not racist. Mm -hmm. Let's, oh, there's HBCUs. Yeah, let's throw some money their way. Let's now support them. And I think it's even worse because just like whatever that proposal allegedly that Biden had of letting all HBCU students um, get free tuition, and it's like, you keep doing everything but what people are actually asking you for. Right. We're asking you to adequately fund us. Mm -hmm. One, that's at the same rate that you're supposed to fund all of your state institutions, whether the HBCUs or not, and then also adequately support them to the same level as you would Penn State or UPenn. Mm -hmm. um, at, whatever, at whatever capacity that is, whether it's financially, politically, whatever. Not, oh, well, let's here partner with this business. And that's different from, say, you know, Arizona State, which is not an HBCU, but because Arizona often trends last in terms of public tax support for education through K-12 through higher ed, because their citizens trend older. I don't want to say they're all MAGATs, but a lot of them are, and they don't, you know, to them, they don't need education. Why do I, I want to fund a public education? I'm 55 or older. And so as a result, Arizona State's president had to go outward, such as making partnerships with Starbucks and Google and all these other corporations to help fund the school. And now they're big as hell. Mm -hmm. And people will miss at that and they say, well, you know, schools are not a, you can't run it like a business. What are you doing? And it's like, well, if you look at what he's dealing with he had at the public state funded, he doesn't have a choice. Right. Or you can raise tuition for all the students. And they're like one of the largest schools in the country. I've been there, it's psycho. So at least comparative to that, it's kind of like, okay, well, the governor is getting involved in it. So I feel like at this stage, it does not look openly shady. I'm not going to say it's not. Um, but also because Pennsylvania is a commonwealth, it's a little bit different than other states. And they can kind of, I don't want to say they can do whatever they want, but, you know, them, Massachusetts, Virginia, they have a little bit different way of doing things. Now, granted, Virginia with um, Northam, I think he's taking the social climate and plus the blackface incident. He got embarrassed. So now he's just trying to pass everything. He got to get it <laughs> out of it, right? <laughs> trying to get it in where he fits in. Yeah. And so I, I think at this stage, it's too early to really tell. Um, could it backfire six months from now? Possibly. Um, but that's also to say that if nothing else happens, um, I think the presidential election will supersede anything that they do. Um, but I'd say for right now, it doesn't really look shady. It does look beneficial, but I think time will tell because who's to say that the businesses um, they're partnering with won't go belly up? Mm. The economy. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to cut it right there. But uh, stay tuned. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Dodgers After Dark on IGTV. We're gonna discuss uh, mm -hmm. Senator Kamala, <laughs> Kamala Harris and her historic VP nomination. So uh, I want to thank everybody for listening tonight. This has been Dodgers After Dark on Sirius 142 HBCU Radio at Howard University. Uh, check us out, hbcudodgers.substack.com. We'll see you the next time. Peace.